when we integrated schools, I think we did it backwards. Like the most, the people most capable of going into those environments are the adults. And when we integrated schools with children first, we set them up for trauma and failure. And we are seeing the results of that today. Those are some of the grandparents and things that we have now that are leading families that experience that trauma. So <clears throat> we continue to try to work to close achievement gaps in schools now based on that. We have first generations of students going to college in 2022, and that's centuries behind um, other people. And so I think that had a huge impact on where our educational system is today for people of color especially. The way it was set up before, um, black schools, black neighborhoods, black teachers, black principals. So when we integrated schools, the black kids went to the white schools. It was not the reverse. Some of the white kids didn't go to some of the black schools. So there were limited spots to teach, limited spots to be a principal. And a lot of those places did, like, they, you had to interview. And you're being interviewed as a principal by the superintendent, who's um, more often than not a white guy uh, back in the 50s. And they just, they weren't getting rid of their white principal at the school that was integrated. They were getting rid of the black principal from the school that the black kids left when they were forced to integrate. Um, and they were forced to integrate. So that meant the black school closed and our, some of the most prominent jobs in education that black people held were no longer available to them. So our kids didn't have the leaders in schools that they had um, when schools were not integrated. So now we kind of see that still playing out in education today. A lot of the leaders in our schools are, don't look like um, a lot of the black kids um, or Mexican or Native American kids that are going to the schools. Um, so it's, it's difficult when you don't see somebody that looks like you in a position of authority. And that's been going on ever since schools were integrated. When I went through school, I didn't have those leaders. And I think having someone like me, um, other um, leaders of color, is the motivation that our kids need to push through um, a system that's set up um, I think where there are biases in the system, where they are not really expected to succeed from a, a system-wide perspective individually. Uh, teachers do try to do their best, um, but students are at a disadvantage. Students of color are at a disadvantage. And so it's, it's difficult. It's more difficult. They're coming to school and they're running the same race that other kids are, but they got concrete boots on. So there's no way that they can compete. So seeing, seeing someone like me in a position of leadership, I think is an encouragement. Uh, being able to have conversations with those students and meet them where they are and have similar experiences and let them know that I was in your place before, exactly where you were. I grew up in the same town that you did. I experienced it some of the same things that you're going through and you can make it. So I think being there, being a leader, motivating myself to get up and do my best each and every day, but also having those conversations with, with students, building relationships with students so that they have that encouragement to just keep on trying. I think asking students of color to specifically, I work with middle school students, to stand up to people that they feel are treating them differently because of their race or they feel like they're being oppressed or denied something is a lot to put on a middle school kid. So what I try to do is have those conversations with teachers about biases that they bring into the space and um, make sure that they try to include uh, content that represents all students in the classroom and not just from one perspective is trying to break down those barriers for, from a systematic perspective, as opposed to, again, putting all of that pressure on a 12 or 13 or 14 year old student. Um, I do have conversations with students um, where I sit down and I talk to them about 
Hey, how are your grades? Oh, you're getting an A in this class? Are you taking an advanced class? No, I didn't know I could. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you do that. Uh, have a conversation with a parent, like let's meet with your counselor. So it's working with that whole family, but I believe that just putting that singular burden on one of those kids is just a little too much. So I try to help break down those systems as opposed to put that on the, on the children. Now that I'm an adult, I realize there were a lot of things that I wasn't taught when I was in school. I think there are several reasons for that. Um, the biggest one that I can think of that's consistent today is that the curriculum that we teach in schools is not teacher directed. The teachers don't pick, get to pick and choose what they teach. Uh, that directive comes down from the state. And so as, uh, as long as you have big state bureaucracies deciding what our teachers can teach in schools and what's important, um, that is a problem. You can have communities, uh, Lawrence is a is a fairly liberal community that I think would support us teaching um, about uh, Greenwood and Tulsa, but that's not necessarily part of our curriculum, so that's not going to get taught. Um, and that's how it was when I was going through school as well. There are certain things are not part of the curriculum, so you just don't get taught that. So I don't necessarily put that on teachers. I think that's more with um, us getting out there, like if we want to make a change so that that is not what's happening, we have to get people out to vote the people in to office that will allow us to teach history the correct way. One of the reasons that we have gaps and we have uh, fewer students of color in college is because they're not pushed. Often we lower the bar for students instead of pushing them to the bar that they we know they can reach. The way that I uh, build that relationship with that kid is just through conversations. So most of these conversations actually happen in the cafeteria at my school. And it just so happens, uh, just like when I was a kid, a lot of the students of color sit together at the same table. So I'll walk by a table, hey, how you doing? And what are you guys talking about? I'm talking about math. I was like, it's lunchtime, you know? Uh, why, are you, why are you talking about math? And oh, well, I really like dividing. I'll say, okay. So you're talking about math and you're talking about dividing, not adding, not multiplying. You're talking about divide, the hardest one of, of the basic math school, skills. So what's going on? Well, I really like it. Oh, so you like math. Okay. So what are your grades in math? And so it builds on just having those casual conversations and seeing where they're at and their interest in it and just pushing them. One thing I hear from a lot of people is that, you know, slavery is over. You know, we did it. There's no more work to do. And like, do you see, do you see oppression in, in Lawrence? And I'm like, well, think about it. You know, like my grandma lives two blocks from me and she was raised in Mississippi and was sharecropping down in Mississippi. This is my grandmother who I was raised with, who lives two blocks from me. Like, there's still that. Like, it's not that long ago. She's right up the street alive, you know? So it's not over. It's not over. And we're not that far removed from it. Like, my daughter might be the first person in our family that really doesn't have the um, trauma coming from a parent that has gone through that. You know, that experience of having to fight just to have just to start with the same pair of shoes on that everybody else does. She, you know, will be in a different place than I ever thought I could be when I w was her age. So um, that's one of those things that I bring up when people are like, well, slavery, that was so long ago. No, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah, we're, we're still working through the trauma of that. And that shows itself in different ways you know, being still in, in poverty, right? A lot of our families are in poverty. A lot of them are living in um, neighborhoods where the schools are poor. A lot of them can't get loans. A lot of them are in places where there's high crime. Those are remnants of being mistreated for decades. Some of those things are still going on now and just a handful of people are in places right now where they're not experiencing those things. So there is 
a lot more to go. A lot of kids have dreams, but in order for those dreams to become reality, it takes community. I don't want our youth to think that the civil rights movement, all that work has already been done. We still have to push, they still have to push, there's still work to do. What I try to instill into our kids is that nothing comes easy. You have to put in the work, sometimes twice as hard. But with the support that you get from me, with the support that you get from others, with the support that you get from your community, that you can get there.